Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service, with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news, seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. The people and projects trying to make our world a better place. I just saw the problem and I knew that there is a way we can use technology to solve it. People Fixing the World from the BBC World Service. You're listening to the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Oliver Conway. This edition is published in the early hours of Thursday, the 11th of April. Palestinians mark the end of Ramadan, but in Gaza there is little to celebrate. Now, everything has changed, and we no longer feel the joyful atmosphere of a feast. There is no Eid. Instead, there are dead people, wounded and injured. This is a holiday of war. Eid Harb. In northern Gaza, three sons of the Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh have been killed by Israel reportedly while travelling to an Eid gathering. Also... This is a voting session and I expect that this session is respected. Despite protests, the European Parliament approves new, tougher laws on migrants. And we have a special report from Ecuador, which now has one of the highest murder rates in Latin America. Also in the podcast, the mounting abuse claims at a boarding school in Jamaica and... Dear Nike, is it possible to buy just one shoe because I only have one foot? The Paralympian with questions for the sports giant. The Muslim festival of Eid al-Fitr is usually a time of joy as friends and families get together to mark the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. But for the people of Gaza, celebrations this year are muted as they contemplate thousands of deaths, the destruction of their homes and a looming famine. This was the experience of children in the southern city of Rafa. Last Eid, we were happy and my father used to take us to play in the amusement parks. We used to celebrate and have parties with my aunts and cousins. There is no Eid. Instead, there are dead people, wounded and injured. This is a holiday of war. Last year's Eid was one of the most beautiful times for me. We used to bake cookies and cakes, buy new clothes and get ready for receiving Eid. But now all our loved ones have died and there are no new clothes to buy. There is no Eid, no Ramadan, and we do not feel alive at all. I have no clothes to wear except for two pairs of trousers and one dress. On last year's Eid, we played, we celebrated and rejoiced together. But this Eid, we miss the taste of happiness. Journalist Gada Uda is also in Rafa, having moved there from her home in northern Gaza. There is no ritual or celebration of Eid. This year, after six months of ongoing war, people are losing their beloved people, relatives, friends, and they just go to destroy mosques and pray the Eid prayer. Most of the mosques here in Rafa are being destroyed, but people like on, on the rubble of these mosques or around uh, these mosques, they are doing the prayer, and maybe in uh, an urban area, they can gather themselves like hundreds. There is no ingredients to do some cakes or some sweets. So people just maybe they are doing some tea, some coffee, normal drinks, and that's it. Got it. Uda in Rafa. Well, the leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, who lives in Qatar, says an Israeli airstrike killed three of his sons and some of his grandchildren while they were on an Eid visit in northern Gaza. Our international editor, Jeremy Bowen, told us more. The airstrike in Gaza was in Shati Camp, or otherwise known as Beach Camp. It's one of the camps in Gaza City. According to local journalists who went to the scene and did various interviews that we've seen with witnesses, they said that in the car there was a driver, there were three of the sons of Ismail Haniya. Reports differ, two or three grandchildren. They were all killed. Three missiles were used in the attack was a powerful force. Body parts were thrown into buildings around there. 
though it was a very difficult scene for the people in the area, they also told local journalists that the Haniyas were going to visit martyrs, in other words, bereaved families. Now, the Israelis very quickly said, yes, we did do this because those three men were going to commit an act of terror and we thwarted them. It's possible that this was something to do with the ceasefire talks because, of course, Ismail Haniyeh is the senior Hamas political leader outside Gaza. And he is intimately involved in the ceasefire talks. And someone was filming it on a phone. When he was told about this, he said, the blood of my sons and grandchildren is no more precious than any other Palestinian. We will not change our position in the talks. Their position in the talks is really quite entrenched effectively in return for a ceasefire and them giving up eventually all the hostages. They want Israel out of Gaza for good 100% and not coming back in. Now, the Israelis are not going to accept that because they want to do that Rafa operation. They want to go into Rafa in the south and finish off, as they see it, the remnants of Hamas. So that is no recipe for a ceasefire. But on top of that, there are indications that Mr. Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, does not want to have a ceasefire because he wants to do that Rafa operation, because he's under pressure from his own ultra-nationalist supporters who say that if he doesn't do it, they'll pull the plug on his government, they'll bring it down. So there are suggestions that I've heard from well-informed sources tonight, not in Israel, but in the region, close to the talks, that perhaps Mr. Netanyahu is just trying to spin it out, play for time, maybe sabotage the talks by giving the orders that this operation should go ahead. Jeremy Bowen in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, several U.S. government officials have told the BBC that internal dissent is growing over President Biden's stance on the war in Gaza. Both current and former employees say his recent comments criticising Israel haven't gone far enough and are calling for a formal evaluation of whether sending weapons to Israel is now breaking international law. The U.S. State Department said staff were encouraged to make their views on policy known through the appropriate channels. Tom Bateman reports from Washington. President Biden's phone call with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last week was a defining moment in the US-Israel relationship after six months of war in Gaza. He threatened to reassess policy towards the country if he didn't see action to reverse the humanitarian catastrophe on the ground. As that has deepened, so has dissent within the US government among some officials who see Washington at once arming Israel, but at the same time failing to compel it to properly protect civilians. Anel Sheline was a foreign affairs officer at the State Department who resigned in protest at US policy a fortnight ago. She says while last week's increase in pressure was welcome, it was too little too late. Clearly the president has significant leverage to use here, and yet... What we're seeing in terms of opening the Erez crossing is is really woefully inadequate. Famine is occurring inside Gaza. There has to be so much more. Earlier this year, hundreds of American and European civil servants signed a letter warning their governments risked being complicit in grave violations of international law over continued military backing for Israel, given the spiralling civilian casualty rate. In the last week, the BBC has spoken to four US civil servants and three former officials who reflected growing exasperation in government. One with two decades national security experience said after the Biden Netanyahu call, they believed Israel had done the bare minimum to get through the day and prevent a halt on US weapons. Israel has consistently denied breaching international humanitarian law in Gaza, blaming Hamas for basing itself in civilian areas and saying military pressure is required to ensure it can get its hostages out. Tom Bateman in Washington. Migration has been a politically sensitive issue in Europe since at least the 2015 migrant crisis. With European elections just eight weeks away, Parliament in Brussels on Wednesday voted through a package of laws designed to toughen border controls, speed up deportations and share out the burden of arrivals across the EU. It was approved despite protests from the visitors' gallery. This is a voting session... This is a voting session, and I expect that this session is respected. We are in a sovereign moment. Well, Greece and Germany called it historic, but Poland said it wouldn't accept the new relocation mechanism. 
So what will this package mean for people arriving in Europe? I ask Nick Beek in Brussels. Well, predominantly, Oliver, it deals with what's called irregular arrivals. So in other words, people coming to Europe by boat and the likes of Spain, but particularly Greece and Italy have been the three countries really at the forefront of that, taking in so many people. And the whole idea is that the system is speeded up. So asylum claims will be assessed, hopefully within 12 weeks. That's the aim. For people who it looks like their case is very, very weak, they may be sent to a so-called third country, which is deemed to be safe. So in other words, they wouldn't stay in the country in which they arrived while their fate was considered and also there is more funding for reception and processing centres to be set up in places like Italy and in Greece. We heard, as I said, that that Poland doesn't like this mechanism to uh, relocate arrivals. I thought this was designed to to sort of solve the problem of, of sharing out the responsibility across Europe. Well, absolutely, and that has been a major obstacle to getting any sort of deal over the past decade or so. What the European leaders, those in the majority, seem to think was that they had some sort of solution here, whereby countries in the north, so traditionally richer countries, the likes of France and Germany, would be taking their share of people who arrive in Europe. However, there has been this sort of secondary element put in place, which also the Polish don't like, and that is that they're able to pay per person arriving. The the figure is €20,000. However, I think there's also this other system which has been snuck in, and that is that the Poles and others who don't particularly like this can send expertise to try and deal with the migrant crisis, which seems to be coming back in Europe at the moment. Anger from both left and right over this. Yeah, the far right, which for them traditionally anti-migrant feeling has won them a lot of votes. They say this is too weak and it will open the floodgates to use a phrase used by a prominent Hungarian lawmaker. On the left, you've got people saying that this is an erosion of people's fundamental human rights and we've got more than 150 charities who look after migrants saying that this is a dark day and that people's rights will be eroded. Nick Beek in Brussels. It is three months since gunmen took over a live TV broadcast in Ecuador, prompting the government to declare the country was in a state of internal armed conflict. It was the most visible episode of the worst security crisis in Ecuador's history, provoked by violence among criminal gangs. The president, Daniel Noboa, recently said the internal armed conflict declaration would remain in place, reinforcing the power of the military. Later this month, the public will vote on further measures like stricter gun controls and tougher prison sentences to try to tackle the violence. So how is Ecuador, once known as an island of peace, now one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America? BBC Mundo's Ana Maria Rura returned home to find out. Ecuador's government has, in effect, declared war on its gangs. Here in the capital, Quito, truckloads of soldiers are carrying out their now daily patrols. They stop and search some people. They've made more than 16,000 arrests in three months. It's incredible to see Quito, a city that used to be very quiet and very touristic, like this, with this amount of military forces on the street. Just five years ago, I never thought I'd be reporting in Ecuador wearing a bulletproof vest and helmet. In January, an evening news program itself became a headline when masked gunmen took over a live broadcast. It showed the world how gang violence has gripped Ecuador. A member of one of the biggest and most violent gangs in Ecuador has agreed to speak to us. Tensions are really high here in Guayaquil, so he always has to be on the move. Paul, not his real name, sits down with us in a car. Paul started dealing drugs for his local gang, aged 15. Since then, the situation has changed dramatically. Things are dangerous right now. That can come at you from anywhere. Global demand for cocaine has surged over the past decade and people like Paul have started trafficking larger and larger quantities. After I press him about his new role, he admits he has killed people. I feel remorse for taking people's life. They have done really bad things, but who am I to take anyone's life? 
Ecuador's official murder rate has shot up since the illegal drugs boom overtaking Colombia and Mexico. I asked Paul why there is so much violence. Everyone wants territory for selling the drugs, for trafficking. Ever since foreign cartels started contacting the gangs here to get them to traffic drugs. 90% of Ecuador's illegal drug exports leave its biggest port in the city of Guayaquil. Listo, comandante. Gracias. The Coast Guard has stepped up its patrols, and I joined the commander on a speedboat. In the past, we were dealing with common criminals. Now, anyone we see could have high-caliber weapons. We pass under a bridge where we can see gang names tagged with graffiti. The Latin Kings, Los Lobos, they are all marking their territory. It's the turf war Paul was telling us about. This is where gangs compete to smuggle cocaine into shipping containers. Lots of people inside the system are corrupt. Sometimes I can tell that the containers have been contaminated at checkpoints inside the port, but mostly they are coming already contaminated. Ecuador's authorities are investigating claims of corruption across its institutions. Michelle Luna dreamt of becoming a public prosecutor since she was six. Her voice breaks when she describes the state of her country. Entrando la fiscalía, pero ahora ya no se puede. Six of her colleagues have been killed in the past two years, and now she fears for her life. If we don't get any more guarantees about our safety, I will have to resign. Lawyers haven't studied and practiced for years to do a job that is suicidal. Stopping the gangs is a major challenge. Yeah, sigue, sigue. Despite the army's presence, the violence has not subsided, and there is a growing unease. How long can the government keep troops on the streets? Anna Maria Rora. And when the BBC put all these issues to Ecuador's government, it told us it had, quote, dramatically reduced the number of violent deaths, eliminated the power of organised gangs in prisons, investigated cases of corruption and was winning the fight against the mafia. And you can watch Anna Maria's documentary Inside Ecuador, Rise of the Gangs, on the BBC News YouTube page. Next to a graduation celebration that's proved popular on Instagram. Women students in Iran are seen dancing, chanting and riding a motorcycle. They're dressed in formal graduation robes with academic mortarboards over their headscarves. But the authorities at Al-Zahra University in southern Iran are not happy about it and have threatened to prosecute them. I heard more from G.R. Gol of the BBC Persian Service. If you listen to the music, it's very upbeat. And you see in the video, those girls are moving their body. Something is prohibited in the Islamic Republic of Iran. If they didn't have a headscarf, you could mistake them with this university student in London or in Sydney or New York. But obviously they are happy, joyously celebrating their graduation by being happy and dancing to the tune of the music, which is very upbeat in south of Iran. It has upset authority. What might the authorities do? I think obviously they've been threatened to prosecute them. Don't forget, just a month ago, another university, sports and science graduation, boys and girls uh, video, very creatively, they edited the video and put it on social media. They shut down the social media account on Instagram and TikTok and other places. And then suddenly you see in other part of the country, another woman group remove their headscarf defiantly. But I think they are threatening those students. They might find those people who filmed and edited and put it on social media, prosecute them. But I don't think they can stop them. Do these students know they're basically taking a risk by posting this stuff and putting it up anyway? Absolutely. Don't forget, a little more than a year, a year ago, a woman was killed in police custody for showing off a little bit of her hair, Mahsa Jina Amini. I think since that uprising, many women in Iran, particularly Generation Z and this new generation, defiantly removing their headscarf or dancing in the street somewhere in the iconic places with the monument behind them in Tehran and other cities. They just want to show this discontent with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Are there Iranians outside the authorities, ordinary Iranians who are offended by this kind of thing? I'm pretty sure there are some pious Muslim who think women shouldn't show off like this, but mass, mass majority of Iranians are enjoying watching such videos. Jia Gol of the BBC Persian Service.
And still to come on the Global News Podcast. It's rare to find such a near complete skeleton buried alongside humans. That's why we're thinking that maybe it was a companion uh, to some of the individuals of the community. No, not a dog, but which other animal could have been man's best friend? The UN nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, will hold an emergency meeting on Thursday to discuss a series of drone attacks on the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Russia and Ukraine have repeatedly accused each other of targeting Europe's biggest nuclear plant. Both deny doing so. From Vienna, where the IAEA is based, is our correspondent Bethany Bell. The IAEA, which has a small team at Zaporizhia, said drones hit a reactor building three times on Sunday, endangering nuclear safety. The Kremlin has said the strikes were carried out by Ukraine and were very dangerous. Kyiv has denied being behind the attacks. It said any incidents were staged by Moscow. The IAEA hasn't blamed either Russia or Ukraine for the drone strikes. But its Director General, Rafael Grossi, said the attacks were reckless and must stop. Whoever is behind them, he said, was playing with fire. He said attacking a nuclear power plant was extremely irresponsible and dangerous. Bethany Bell. A US-owned boarding school in Jamaica is in the spotlight after four employees were arrested and charged with child abuse. In February, eight American boys were removed from the Atlantis Leadership Academy after abuse claims came to light during an unannounced welfare check. Its founder and director, Randall Cook, who was not arrested, told NBC News in a statement that ALA is appalled at the hatchet job that's being done to our reputation and deny all the allegations that have been coming at us after over eight years in operation. The Academy is part of a network of boarding schools, camps and ranches marketed at reforming teenagers with behavioural issues. James Reynolds got the latest on the investigation from Tyler Kincaid, an LA-based reporter for NBC. There's two. There's one from the local law enforcement and then there's one from the child welfare officials. CPFSA is the agency down there. They did a welfare check on the boys back in February and immediately noticed what they have described as signs of abuse and possible neglect and took the boys into protective custody. One was immediately released back to the United States because he was already 18. Two more have since been cleared to be released, and Jamaica still has another handful of boys down there as they go through the process to return them back to the United States. The investigation at this point is still ongoing. What we know currently is that the boys have alleged that they were physically beaten There's other information that we're still working to confirm, but it's a very dire situation. What we're hearing from parents as well is that they often did not have a lot of communication with the boys while they were down there in Jamaica. Tell us more about these schools, how they began, how prevalent they are in different countries. These schools in the United States, at least, have been around for half century at this point. There's one from very hardline religious groups that created reform schools back in the 50s and 60s that still have, uh, you can trace a lineage to some of the facilities in operation today that claim religious exemptions to avoid some state laws that would otherwise govern the youth facilities. Then there's some others that go back to a drug rehab program that was known as Synanon that dissolved. It started in the 50s, 60s and out here in California. Today, it's much more professionalized in many places. There's a whole range of them. They range from boot camps to ranches to treatment centers, to boarding schools. But the commonality is that none of them are typically subject to any sort of federal regulation. And then our states have very different laws around the country for how in-depth local officials will be in investigating or checking in on the welfare of the children. So a lot of times we don't really hear about problems going on until the children are out and back home, and then they speak out once they're adults. And that's what's been going on the past couple of years. Tyler Kincaid talking to James Reynolds. 
As Paris gears up to host this summer's Olympics, there are worrying reports for those competitors hoping to take part in the triathlon, paratriathlon and swimming marathon. All those events are supposed to take place in the River Seine, in the heart of the French capital. But there are fears it may not be clean enough after a series of tests showed alarming levels of E. coli bacteria in the water. Our correspondent Hugh Schofield has the details. That's President Macron a couple of weeks ago announcing that he'll personally be bathing in the River Seine once preparations for the Olympics are complete. But is he, are all the Olympics organisers being over-optimistic? An environmental NGO, Surfrider, has just reported findings that suggest the River Seine is still not as clean as had been hoped. Project manager Lucy Segala. Since September 2023, we've taken 14 samples, including 12 for which we've obtained levels above the threshold recommended by the Ministry of Health website. And we also have 13 samples that are above the thresholds recommended by the International Swimming and Triathlon Federation. Here on the banks of the Seine, it's impossible without taking samples and testing them in a laboratory to assess the quality of the water. All that we can say for sure is that there has been a remarkable improvement going back more than 20 years now, thanks mainly to investment in sanitation upstream. But with the Olympics approaching, the task has been to push the quality up to an even higher level so that swimming can be permitted. For the public, that's supposed to be one of the legacies of the Games. One way they've been trying to do that is by stopping the many barges and pleasure boats that are moored along the river here from dumping their wastewater into the river. Pierre Morier owns and lives on one of the barges. We haven't been allowed for a very long time to dump black water or grey water into the Seine. It's true that with the Olympic Games, there is a mobilisation to regularise the situation for boats. But for us, in any case, it was very logical and very necessary to send our wastewater somewhere other than the Seine. There's also been millions invested in a vast underground reservoir near the Austerlitz station. This is intended to hold runoff from the city's drains when there's heavy rainfall and stop it going into the Seine. The Olympics organisers point out that this wasn't in operation when the NGO took its water readings. And they also say that winter water quality is not the same as summer water quality, which is obviously what counts. Pierre Rabadon is the Paris deputy mayor in charge of the Olympics. Winter is not our goal, and that's why the results released by Surf Rider don't correspond to our objectives haven't taught us anything. We knew that at the time the water quality was not yet satisfactory for bathing and that's not our priority objective. Our objective is the summer. That report from Paris by Hugh Schofield. Inclusivity is an important value for many sports brands. You may have seen adverts for sportswear or shoes with models who are amputees. Some shops now even have mannequins wearing running blades. Paralympian Steph Reed, who has only one foot, was excited by this development, but also had questions for the firm behind it. Dear Nike, is it possible to buy just one shoe because I only have one foot? Two friends recently sent me photos of mannequins in Nike stores with running blades, and I thought this was awesome. But then I asked Nike the obvious question. You can pause to read the full conversation, but here are the highlights. The answer was no. They offered a one-time 10% discount, which I said was very kind, but next time I buy running shoes, I'm still only going to have one foot, so it's not really a solution. Well, Steph Reed's video has been viewed millions of times on TikTok and Instagram. She says other brands like Decathlon and Brooks also feature amputee models in their campaigns. She's been talking about the issue to the BBC. 